Thanks for joining us today for our presentation on phenotypic expression and why it matters. Uh, at Inspire Transpiration Solutions, we provide integrated HVACD solutions for cultivation and curing. And we're always thinking about how we can increase the performance of our partner facilities by focusing on plant health and performance. We developed this webinar by drawing on our combined decades of real world cultivation and business experience. And it's easy to lose track of the fundamentals amongst emerging data and crop steering theories we want to make sure that we're thinking about the end product when it comes to all aspects of facility design. We will be recording this webinar and it will be available soon on our website with our other webinars if you want to revisit. And to start, I want to give a quick introduction to my friend and co-presenter, Anders Peterson, who's a molecular biologist with hands in the dirt cultivation experience, owned an extract company, dispensary, and has been a valued partner to numerous large-scale cannabis businesses. And I've been in the cannabis businesses business since graduating Berkeley like 15 years ago. I've owned cannabis businesses, run cultivation facilities, and use that knowledge and experience to help facilities produce the best product as efficiently as possible. Together, we analyze peer-reviewed papers, real-world metrics, and data, and turn cannabis science into business solutions by focusing on the KPIs that influence every aspect of cannabis production. And that's the reason we get so drawn to discussions on phenotype. In this webinar, we'd like to focus on the meaning of a phenotype and why it is the foundation to success of indoor cultivation businesses. Please comment and ask questions as we go, and we'll dedicate 30 minutes after the webinar to a Q&A answer sesh moderated by Inspire's C COO, Brian Hesterman, and CEO, Adrian Giovinco. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Anders and let us get started. Thanks, Jesse. Well, I'm excited to be here today to talk about a subject that is near and dear to my heart, phenotypes and phenotypic expression. And really what we are talking about is the uniqueness of cannabis, varieties, and how we can maximize the expression of each cultivar. There are more desirable phenotypes and there are less desirable phenotypes. Then there are certain varieties stacked with so many desirable traits that it's like you just stumbled upon a unicorn. It's a keeper. Hunting through all this variety in cannabis to find something truly special is a huge reason why people devote their life to this plant, including myself. The variety keeps it fun and interesting. The smells, colors, effects, or how it grows. You might have heard of Skunk 1, Chem 91, Northern Lights 5, all the OG Cush and Girl Scout varieties. These names and numbers represent a unique expression of the cannabis genome, and we're going to explain how that works and why the environment in which they are grown is so crucial. Legends, brands, and fortunes are built on good genetic potential with maximum phenotypic expression. Let's begin with the definition, phenotype. The set of observable characteristics of an individual resulting from the interaction of its genotype with the environment. And in regards to cannabis, phenotype describes the plant's physical appearance or form, its developmental growth, its biochemistry, and its behavior. The key words to focus on here are interaction of genotype with the environment. In fact, this definition is often simplified and represented as an equation. Genotype plus environment equals phenotype. So really, there are two factors that generally influence the way a plant grows, the genetics and the environment. The environment is 50% of the equation. And that is why having precision environmental control in your facility is so important. The term phenotype can be used in two different ways. It can get kind of a little bit convoluted. Phenotype can refer to a singular trait that the plant displays, for example, color. This plant displays a purple flower phenotype and this other plant displays a green flower phenotype. Or it can refer to all of the observable characteristics displayed by a certain plant. The phenotype of this plant is more desirable than the phenotype displayed by this other plant. Scientists tried to clear this dual meaning up by introducing the term phenome, similar to genome, to describe the collection of traits a plant exhibits. But this was never really universally adopted. So we use phenotype to describe a singular trait or an accumulation of all the traits expressed by a plant under certain environmental conditions. Another nuance to this definition of phenotype is the word observable, but that doesn't mean just with the naked eye. 
it can also mean traits that can be made visible by some technical procedure, like in a laboratory. An example of this in humans would be blood typing. You can't see it with the naked eye, but it is a phenotype of yourself. And in cannabis, the cannabinoid and terpene profiles that you see on lab reports. To describe the unique chemical expression of the plant, we use the term chemotype, or sometimes chemovar, which is the chemical phenotype. This is the cannabinoid and terpene quantities and ratios that a specific cannabis phenotype produces. Currently, there are about five broad classes of cannabis chemotypes based on the dominant cannabinoid that is produced. Now that we have a base understanding of what a phenotype is, let's dive into what a genotype is, a quick refresher on how genes are expressed, and some examples of how the environment can affect the expression of these genes in cannabis. What is a genotype? A genotype is an organism's complete set of genetic material, although it is often used to refer to a specific gene or a set of genes in a genome. Think of it as like the basic genetic boundaries which define a range of phenotypic possibilities. Just like humans, cannabis is diploid and has two homologous copies of each chromosome, one copy from the male parent plant and one from the female parent plant. Each chromosome in the pair contains the same genes in the same order and place along the length of the chromosome. These genes then get expressed into the phenotypic traits that we observe. A segment of the double-stranded DNA undergoes transcription, which forms a single-stranded RNA transcript, which is then translated into a functional protein. And in this kind of oversimplified example to the right, this protein might help produce a purple pigment. And then the end result of this gene expression is a purple flower. Punnett squares are used by biologists to determine the probability of an offspring having a particular genotype. It shows all the possible combinations of paternal and maternal alleles. We have the parental genotypes with each of their dominant or recessive alleles, one allele from each of their chromosomes. Then we have the offspring's predicted genotypes and phenotypes. In this example, the allele for tall plant is dominant. So wherever we see a big T, the plant will be tall. If the offspring inherited two recessive alleles, little t, then we see a short plant phenotype, like the square in the bottom right. Punnett squares can be used to predict phenotypes, but without a real high degree of accuracy. And why is this? Well, because there are a lot of other factors at play that influence how these genotypes are expressed, and one of the most important being the environment. Now, some traits are largely determined by the genotype alone while other phenotypic traits are highly influenced by the environment. This can be described as phenotypic plasticity, the ability to vary phenotypic expression in response to environmental conditions. This is why you can get two clones with identical genotypes to two different growers, and the end product could look completely different from each other due to the way the environment steers and influences the plant's growth. Plant growth rates, morphology, and timing of plant development are examples of some traits that are generally plastic. Anecdotally, all cannabis cultiv cultivators know that with tighter control on your environment, you tend to see higher yields and a more potent product. Now, each of these colored lines on the graphs below represent a genotype. In the first graph, we see no plasticity. The environment has little to no effect on how that gene is expressed. Compared to the graph on the far right, where we see a strong genotype by environment interaction. As cultivators, we can take advantage of the plasticity of certain phenotypic traits by altering the environment to elicit certain responses in the crop that are beneficial. Now let's go through a few examples of this. Anthocyanins. 
the pigments that are responsible for all the purples, pinks, and colors we see in cannabis flowers. You must have a cultivar with the genetic potential to produce these beautiful pigments. But if the plant is exposed to too high of a temperature at the end of its flowering cycle, then you will not get a full expression of these colors and the proteins that produce them will degrade. How cold do we need to get the room? And for how long? Nobody really knows yet. And it can vary from cultivar to cultivar. But the colder we get the room, we know that the slower the metabolic plate of the rant will be. Too cold for too long, we could sacrifice yield. Too warm, we could lose some color. Glitchy. Okay, let's try this again. So, nobody really knows, and it can vary from cultivar to cultivar. But the colder we get the room, the slower the metabolic rate of the plant will be. Too cold for too long, we could sacrifice yield. Too warm, we could lose some color. Really, it's a delicate balance to bring out these colors in cannabis. Another example is the day to night temperature differential. With a warmer lights on temp and a cooler lights off temp, we have a positive diff. This promotes stem elongation or stretch. With a cooler lights on temp and a warmer lights off temp, we have a negative diff. This suppresses stem elongation. And for cultivars like GMO, garlic cookies, that stretch crazy the first three weeks of flower, we can use this environmental crop stirring technique to keep them at a manageable height. Now, there are many more examples of environmental influences on phenotypic expression, but more research is needed to determine exactly which genes are influenced by the environment and those that are not. One of the most fun things to do as a cannabis grower is popping seeds and hunting for a new pheno. With inbred lines of corn or soy, you pop a million seeds and all those plants will look and yield very similar. But due to the variability in the cannabis genome and the lack of professional breeding to stabilize genetics at this point in the industry, primarily due to prohibition, a pack of just 10 or 12 seeds with slightly different yet related genotypes will yield a huge variability between plants. Therefore, most growers utilize clones. But before you can use clones, you must find a phenotype with enough desirable traits to keep in your staple as a mother plant. So the process goes something like this. Let's say I get a pack of 10 regular seeds from the same cross. They all germinate. And then I arbitrarily label them one through 10 to keep track. They continue to grow and eventually start showing their sex. Dang it, I got four males and I'm not looking to breed. So I cull six through nine. Shucks, <laughs> number 10 was hermaphroditic, which is a sign of unstable genetics. And I don't want pollen in my flowering room. Let's toss it. Looks like on this funeral hunt, I have five females to hunt through. So they continue to flower and begin showing the full extent of their phenotypic expression. Three through five start showing some purple. One and two stay more green. Phenols one and two have a cakey tur profile and three through five smell like I just opened my gas tank. But wait, phenol three is gassy and cakey. I like that. And maybe phenols one, three, and five had a pretty good yield at the end of the day. But phenol three had everything I was looking for. She is the keeper of the bunch. And I decided to call her gas cake number three. <laughs> and that's a simple explanation of how growers go about hunting for good phenotypes. All of the popular phenotypes of gelato is another great example. Originally bred in Northern California with genetics from the cookie family and Mario Guzman, AKA Sherbinsky. It is a cross of sunset sherbet and thin mint Girl Scout cookies. Then they collected all the seeds from that cross and hunted for phenos. For simplicity's sake, let's say there were a hundred seeds in this hunt 
labeled 1 through 100. And it just so happened that numbers 33, 41, 43, and so on really stood out as being special. So special that they each got their own unique name. Gelato 33 became Larry Bird. And Gelato 41, my favorite pheno of gelato, became Baccio Gelato. They had mother plants for each of these phenotypes, cloned them, and disseminated them throughout the industry. But again, do not expect to see this level of quality in every batch of gelato you pick up at the dispensary. It all comes back to the environment they are grown in. Now, there are so many other qualities to look out for in a good phenotype than just color, aroma, and yield. And this slide just shows a few of those traits that growers and breeders look out for. And with that, I'd like to pass the mic over to my good friend, Jesse, and have him take it away from here. Great info per usual, Durs. Always great to hear you talk about the science of phenotypic expression. And I think the gelato example you chose is a great one because it resonates with cultivators, and brokers, and buyers alike. Think about sales for a second. Currently, the sell-through numbers and customer preference is based on THC content and name recognition. For example, Gelato 33 could be worth three to $500 more per pound than Gelato 49. But why? It has appeal for a number of reasons. Name recognition and hype, bud structure, THC content, nose, color, and intense effects. But what if all of a sudden there was a discovery proving that the chemotype of Gelato 49 was the best medicine for MS or a particular cancer? The entourage effect and the relational proportions of the secondary metabolites would increase its value. If that were the case, Gelato 49 might now get you three to $500 more per pound than Gelato 33, all based on phenotypic expression. And that's one reason why phenotypes, COAs, and environmental control are so important for the future of cannabis medicine and success in the cannabis marketplace. Here you see a list of traits that many people consider when breeding or selecting for commercial cultivation. I'll admit, I'm a trait chaser. And to be honest, I've chucked pollen, hunted, and done generations of line work to find cultivars resistant to broad mites in Oakland or root aphids in Colorado. I've chased faster finishing times, better production under LEDs. I've selected phenotypes because they rooted faster for my commercial clone operation or produce more THC and terps to win cannabis competitions. I've found genetics that produce higher yields above 5,000 feet and ones that are drought tolerant. And Anders always reminds me of the importance of trichome size and cuticle thickness for my solventless extracts. The result of the laborious and time-consuming pheno hunts led to healthier plants geared towards my environments with better effects, both medically and recreationally. These decisions have directly impacted the financial success of my cannabis businesses. Prioritizing the traits that have the most impact on your business plan and goals should be something you're always considering. And this brings us to key performance indicators. KPIs are how we benchmark the performance of our phenotypes and our cannabis businesses. It's a great way to determine the efficiency of your facility as a whole, as well as your ability to capture phenotypic expression. There are primary, secondary, and even tertiary KPIs that should be considered, but we wanted to focus on a few big ones here. First, let's talk about KPIs that measure quantity. Grams per square foot is one that we all know and use to measure yield. How much biomass did we generate per canopy square foot? Another measure of quantity plus efficiency is grams per watt. How much biomass do we generate relative to energy consumed? And a third quantity KPI is leaf to trim ratio. A cultivar with less leaf will be easier to trim, produce less shake, and give you more sellable flour per square foot. These are great measurements, but the deeper question is, did we optimize environmental conditions to get the most possible sellable weight from our phenotype. Next, we have KPIs that measure quality, like active compounds per gram, per watt, and per square foot. The question here is, did we maximize secondary metabolite production relative to cultivar? And did we cure it appropriately to protect those desired compounds? The active compounds you collect will directly impact the price per pound of your sellable flour 
and your extract yields. Any buyer will tell you gelato that tests at 20% THC is just not as valuable as gelato that tests above 30. And any concentrate manufacturer will tell you it's fire in, fire out. Those are the market and production expectations from a phenotypic expression perspective. Another KPI is harvest cycles per year and refers to the length of time it takes your cultivar to finish. It will impact your speed to market and your plant flow process. Finding a phenotype that allows you to harvest one more cycle per year can transform a business. Maximizing quantity and quality will get you the lowest cost of production and the most efficient production facility. And let's be honest, anyone can get one good run, but the key to long-term success is consistency. Consistent excellence comes from accurate data collection per cultivar and optimizing their expression with environmental control. Consistency is the difference between a good batch and a good brand. Consistent environment equates and equals consistent customer experience and predictable production levels. But these KPIs also speak to the value of a gram. What's a gram really worth? Well, it depends on who you ask. With 15,000 square feet of canopy and five turns a year and a $2,500 price per pound, one gram is worth $400,000. With six turns a year, it's $500,000. If you can optimize the genetics and get a few more hundred dollars per pound, one gram will be worth more than $600,000. Now squeeze out one extra cycle with the right phenotype and it could be $700,000. And remember, we're just talking about one gram. Phenotypic expression is key to getting you the highest price per pound possible and the best yield, but it also impacts your brand. Phenotypic expression is what customers are buying. And the stable of phenotypes you produce gives you strategic pricing per cultivar, like the gelato example we used earlier. But that expression also translates to cannabis awards, influences the price a customer is willing to pay, how much they buy, and ultimately the financial success of cultivators, distributors, and dispensaries. It also plays a major role in customer satisfaction, which leads us to the importance of COAs. COAs get you paid and they help create action plans, but they also save lives. COAs are how current purchasing decisions are being made at the commercial level and how we begin to correlate medical efficacy to secondary metabolite production. This, an, this is an example of measured cannabinoids and terpenes or what we know as chemotype that Anders had mentioned earlier. This particular example is of FATSO, which tested at 44% THC and 3.1% terpenes. Looking for a specific chemotype profile can be a target for personalized medicine or a recreational experience that helps determine value. And as a former commercial buyer for dispensaries, these, this, this game used to be different. A cultivator would bring in 10 pounds or so into my office, drop it on my desk. I'd squish the bud between my fingers, give it the nose test, the eye test, roll it up, see how it burned, and then give my value assessment. Now value assessments are based on the numbers provided by COAs, and even medical research is driven by chemotype information. Purchases today are based on percentages, not personal relationships. So how do we improve our COAs and monetize the value of a test result? Environmental control. Quality, quantity, consistency, and efficiency is about optimizing all 10 current cardinal parameters in this space. And we could go through all 10, but I think we will save that deeper dive for another webinar. But I do think this slide does help illustrate the impact of environmental conditions and phenotypic expression on a larger scale facility design. Lighting is a great example. We think spectrum control will help you produce more terpenes and people are choosing to pursue high PPFD lighting because the science tells us that it will equate to more yield. But increasing light quality and quantity will mean more transpiration, more CO2, and likely a higher EC. But what is the leaf temp offset relative to your lighting choice? 
Controlling VPD isn't as simple as picking a temp and humidity set point. In order to use VPD effectively, you have to control the temperature of the leaf. And with that knowledge, how do we measure and maintain ambient conditions to optimize the plant's photosynthetic rate? Can we deliver CO2 with the appropriate velocities directly to the plant stomata to drive the utilization of these photons? How do we adjust fertigation strategies and airflow to optimize the performance of each cultivar in a high PPFD environment? We're just getting started and this is only one parameter. Environmental crop steering is the key to getting the best COAs and it's backed by scientific research. During the flower period, we can induce drought stress with controlled drybacks to increase secondary metabolite production. We can acidify the media and lower temps to produce anthocyanins. We can increase EC, increase VPD, and reduce feed duration with measurable positive results. However, your ability to apply environmental crop steering techniques is only possible with precision environmental control. Without control, it's just stress. Focus on control of all 10 cardinal parameters and you can design a facility to drive any cultivar that the market demands. Build a facility with limited control and the choice of high performing cultivars will also be limited. The 10 cardinal parameters are a symphony. Get it wrong and your band is off key. Get it right and you have a masterpiece that everyone is excited to experience. The biggest limiting factor for phenotypic expression is your environment. And environment control, environmental control is 50% of what makes up a phenotype and 100% of what makes each cultivar special is phenotypic expression. It's all about control and what you do with control that drives plant expression increases financial performance. So that's why it's so important to think about these interactions when it comes to building your cannabis business. With that, uh, I think we want to really thank everyone for listening to us talk about the plant that we love so much. And uh, obviously, we'd love to hear from the community on future webinars that we can dive into um, and express some experiences about. But from here, I think we're going to spend another 30 minutes or so to jump into some question and answers from the community. So with that, let's turn it over to Brian and jump right in. Thanks, Jesse. Thanks, Anders. I was really good guys and I'm super excited to jump into Q&A with you. Uh, as a reminder to the audience, uh, please use the chat window to let us know what topic you'd like to hear about on our next webinar. Uh, I already see some good questions coming in as well. Um, but to get things kicked off, uh, your presentation spurred a thought for me. Uh, it, it reminded me how closely plants are related to humans. I mean, essentially we're talking about the evolution of the cannabis genome here. And it's just like the nature versus nurture conversation we have about children. Uh, a child could be born with the best genetic makeup, but without a good environment, they may never realize their full potential. Uh, so with that in mind, I'm wondering what environmental parameters have the biggest impact on phenotypic expression? Well, first of all, I love that analogy you made with your kids. And one thing I like to think about with plants versus people is there's a lot of corollaries, but People can are mobile and plants are sessile. So people can move out of undesirable environments into more preferable one. But plants have to have all these mechanisms to adapt to poor environmental conditions. Now, which environmental parameter or which parameter in general um, has the most influence? I wouldn't say it's just one. Like Jesse said, with 10 cardinal parameters, to me, it's a symphony of balancing all of them into the right parameters and ratios to get the maximum phenotypic production. Yeah, I mean, I think it's dangerous to focus on one. They're all so interconnected. I mean, it's so easy to get excited about Instagramming your lights or your racks or your fertigation <laughs> skid or the cool facility you've built, but it's the interaction and how one influences the other when we talk about these parameters that really ultimately give us the phenotypic expression. So you can't adjust one without the other and understanding that relationship is just as important in investing in one wholeheartedly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Uh, I guess it's part of the, the 
challenge, the huge challenge and, and the potential reward that uh, cultivators have uh, just because there's just such a multidisciplinary challenge and there's so many parameters to take into account. And it's also genetic specific, right? It depends on the, the parameters, depend on what genetics you're growing as well. Definitely. I mean, you can have the coolest irrigation, most precise irrigation fertigation system ever, but if you can't control temperature and relative humidity, you can't drive that transpiration rate, um, you know, move nutrients throughout the plant and just drive the metabolic rate of the plant in general. So it's a, it's a limiting factor game really. And this joke that I used to make is, um, you know, give me antiquated lighting styles, cheap nutrients, recycled media, but let me control the environment. And I'm always going to get to the finish line and with a great product. And I guess what I mean by that is your biggest limiting factor is HVAC, which is why in a lot of ways, you know, HVAC became HVAC became like a four letter word for me in the industry for so long, not having purpose built technology or the tools at my disposal to optimize all the other parameters. It was that everything was limited by my lack of investment or lack of access to technology from an environmental control standpoint. Environmental control is your best form of crop insurance, is uh, one <laughs> wise sage once told us, I think. Um, I like well, speaking of uh, genetics, uh, there's a really interesting question here um, from a member of our audience um, asking about your opinion on indica and sativa classification versus chemovar classification. Uh, mm. Do you... Do you do we already see a shift in the industry towards chemovar classification versus the traditional indica versus sativa ge geography type of classification? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think we all have kind of learned that the traditional indica sativa hybrid classification, there's no real genetic basis for it. Uh, it's one species and you know, we're learning that there needs to be a new way to group these cultivars and on the shelf and then also in for medical purposes. I think for medicinal purposes and recreational, grouping them by chemotypes, um, type one, type two, type three, type four, type five plants in general is a good first step. But I don't think it takes into account all of the nuances that we need to use to describe these plants. Um, in general. And so I, it's definitely a big area. I've seen some groups in the industry try and put forth their own uh, nomenclature and ways of, you know, grouping these different cultivars. Um, I haven't ever seen one fully get adopted yet. Uh, and I can't wait because it's going to help dispensaries a ton being able to put these on the shelves in a more accurate way. Um, and it'll help, you know, patients and consumers be able to purchase more wisely. I foresee a, a nomenclature that has to do with the dominant cannabinoid and then also paired with the dominant terpene in that profile so that we can understand the entourage effect. But I think until we do more research on those interactions that produce these entourage effects, there's not going to be a good system. So, yeah, And I, I think the relational proportion of those terpenes too and understanding the entourage effect and what percentage of beta caryophylline beta relative to another terpene or whatever it may be from a scientific application and formulary perspective or a you know recreational perspective. As a guy who ran dispensaries, it was so easy to train staff a long time ago where you say, this is an indica, it's gonna give you couch lock, this is a sativa, it's gonna make you creative. Um, and that was more of a marketing ploy. We yeah. have so many polyhybrids in this space now that it's really about understanding the chemotype and being able to read that certificate of authenticity or analysis to determine what the best medicine or best recreational product is for someone. And I just don't think there's enough good research out there uh, to educate the consumer. There's certainly a movement where people are coming in looking for, you know, particular things, but that dialogue isn't deep and rich enough yet for a customer to come in and say, Hey, I'm looking for these four terpenes because my endocannabinoid, you know, receptors react a certain way. And as a result, that's what I want to take on the boat when I go fishing, or that's what I want to use to write my novel. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of challenges, but 
the more research we get and the more correlations we get, I think we'll better have the language to really satisfy the consumers in the space. Yep. And at the end of the day, everything we buy at the dispensary is a hybrid now. There are no indicas and sativas. We have, I mean, we have indicas that give you sativa-like effects and things labeled sativa that give you indica-like effects. I mean, it's a mess. So there needs yeah. to be a better system. And to, and to circle back with the, the relation of cannabis to humans, it all depends on our own endocannabinoid system as well, right? Yep. Uh, what, what gives you couch lock may give me anxiety. What helps alleviate a, a certain condition for you may exacerbate it or may not give me any curative effects. That's exactly uh, right. And the research being done in Israel on um, using cannabinoids to fight cancer they're finding that these ratios and quantities of different terpenes and cannabinoid, you know, together is very specific to that form of cancer and that person. And it's a huge challenge figuring out with all these permutations, what is right for you and your ailment and your disease. So it's a, it's a lot of research. Yeah. It's exciting though. 140 or 150 different cannabinoids and cannabis. And we're focused on two or three of them right now. Well, that's because of prohibition, right? I mean, we accidentally selected for high THC cultivars for decades, and now we're having to bring back those other genes and get them expressed in higher quantities. Um, yeah, it's just going to take time to catch up. Yeah, yeah. And so your, your points about, um, well, the plasticity of, of phenotypes, um, maybe you guys could talk a little bit about um, the, the chemical composition um, or the, the chemovars and the ability to manipulate those potentially or, or, or express the, the chemical composition differently through, through environmental practices. The way I like to think about it is the essential dominating cannabinoids and terpenes are genetically determined the basic ratio of what that plant can produce is determined at the genotype level. But the overall quantity that you get at the end of the day is highly determined by the environment. So I can have a two to one THC to CBD ratio cultivar, but I might only get, you know, 10% THC, 5% CBD, or with a better environment, I can make that ratio 20% to 10%, right? So we can get higher potency but with similar ratios. It doesn't always hold true, but that's kind of the generally the way I like to think about it. Yeah, I mean, I think anecdotally, historically, there's always been conversations about plant stress increasing some sort of aspect uh, that we want in the final product. You know, whether it's a book from the 1970s talking about mm -hmm. sticking something through the stem in order to get higher THC. Uh, I think now we've really evolved the concept of stress to embody what we're trying to do from an environmental crop steering perspective. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have these stresses, but controlling the stresses and understanding the cost benefit analysis of applying these stresses is the important part. And, you know, you might have some sort of aspect of stress, let's call it temperature that brings out color. And we bring that in, in the late stages, we have to understand the customer and the business and does that temperature stress equate to more performance not necessarily right we're slowing the plant's metabolic rate so we're going to probably compromise our biomass accumulation but does it give us more bag appeal that raises the price per pound or gets people more excited in the market for it it's a balance so many of those in cannabis these delicate so balances with cultivation in general and really, like to me, the, the phenotypic plasticity, the ability of these genes to be influenced by the environment is the prerequisite and really what gives us the ability to employ environmental crops during techniques. You know, like we're taking advantage of that and we're able to steer that crop into a way that is more beneficial for our facility and our business or plant health. Yeah. There's a question here on auto flowers, guys. Um, Pros and cons of commercially growing auto flowers. Thoughts there? I like the commercial viability part, so I can avoid some of my personal opinions on consuming <laughs> auto flowers. But I think 
for me as a guy who's been, you know, an outdoor cultivator with experience up north in the Klamath area, uh, one of the reasons I love auto flowers, it allows me to sneak in another cycle every year. And I can put out these auto flowers early. I know when they're going to harvest, they're not triggered by the light. All of a sudden I get an additional harvest um, mm -hmm. before I put out my large scale harvest. So there's definitely a benefit to auto flowers. And you see a lot of current publications and authors talking about the evolution of auto flowers getting better and better and better. Um, realistically, I mean, it's, it's a cross with ruderalis, right? It's a cross with, um, I lovingly say ditch weed, but realistically there might be medical viability that's coming through auto flowers because of their willingness to sort of step back into this genetic pool and pull out other secondary cannabinoids that right now are currently not prized. So from a commercial viability perspective, I like the run of it. Um, from a crop steering and plant management perspective, it can be challenged, challenged to run nothing but auto flowers in your space. But from a genetic preservation perspective and the ability to pull from that pool in looking for medicine, I mean, I think a lot about my mom who was sick with cancer, right? Like when she was sick, it was, we weren't even talking about CBD. That wasn't really even a thing. Mm -hmm. um, and for her to have consistent access to medicine was a challenge. So for me, consistent phenotypic expression and, you know, chemo var analysis is really important for medical viability. People can go and have an expected result from a product they get. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you can think what you want about auto flowers, but it's definitely a niche part of this market that allows us to continue to grow and explore new business opportunities. Yeah. And from an extract perspective, I'd love to hear what you think, Anders, because I know a lot of guys up north that I know are like, hey, let's run auto flower. We're going to run everything through the press at the end of the, the cycle. And then we're going to run this big flower harvest and try and get nothing but cherries that go in a jar on the shelf. Um, but it diversifies their, their market share. Yeah. I mean, well, in, in regards to that in concentration, resin is resin, whether it's an auto flower variety or not. So if you grow good resin, cleanly and surely, and there's a lot of it, and you can preserve that quality of that resin throughout the extraction process. I don't see an issue with it. Um, I am kind of blown away at how far auto flowers have progressed in the last decade or so. I mean, I never really saw an auto flower that I wanted to consume or grow or anything. I mean, it just wasn't that impressive to me. And lately there have been some auto flower genetics that I'm like very interested in checking out. Um, in terms of growing it, you know, uh, but in, at a commercial indoor facility, I see some challenges with auto flowers because one of the biggest challenges of running one of these large scale facilities is scheduling and, uh, scheduling the rotation of your rooms and your crops from propagation to veg to generative growth. And, you know, the plasticity that we can play with by holding plants into a certain photo period and not having them flower automatically gives us some flexibility to hold things back. With auto flowers, we can't necessarily do that because its clock has started. It's on a predetermined timeline for me, but with the ability to have photo period sensitive plants, you can have a little bit more flexibility in your crop rotation, um, holding things back in veg if you, room, you want to take that flower room an extra week, what have you. Um, I do see some challenges in that side of auto flowers and the genetics need to catch up a little bit more in terms of uh, plant vitality and expression. I think that's coming, but I also think about sort of how people go about, you know, the auto flower process. And it's usually trying to find feminized seeds and popping these feminized seeds. And I think in a lot of ways, because you don't have this genetic mother stock for consistency, you're going to have genetic variability until we get a higher progression of breeding in the auto flower in the industry as a whole, um, it's hard to pop 200 auto flower seeds and expect them to all be the same. Yep. So that's a challenge uh, from a go-to-market strategy as well. Totally. Yeah, interesting. Um, well, maybe we can uh, shift gears here real quick and um, talk about some, some facility-specific items. Um, what, what are the highest impact items to consider to maximize from the types of the new facility? Highest impact items to maximize phenotypes in the new facility. Well, first and foremost, you have to have good genetics. 
right? You, you build this golden spaceship of a facility, but if you don't have good genetics to put into it, then there's not much you can do in terms of maximizing phenotypic expression if they're just poor genetic samples to begin with. Other than that, to me, it's about control. Having control of all of those parameters and not just some control, but as tight of a control as you possibly can. Um, there's challenges with that from a business standpoint because the more control and automation and data collection you get, the higher the capital expenditures are to start that business. You also tend to then with, see a higher capex, a lower operating expenditures for that facility. But you know the control is going to cost you something, but you're going to get that back by with the maximization of these phenotypes and the increase in yield that we see. So to me, it's a trade-off that in the long run is really worth it. You know, investing in the right equipment to control all of the parameters. I mean, the, the HVAC, the CO2 supplementation, uh, your lighting type and, and lighting layout, your irrigation fertigation system, everything. And then there's the construction of the facility itself, making sure it's well sealed, clean. We're not bringing things in that are gonna harm our crop. All of those things go into maximizing your phenotypic expression, getting the most out of that crop. I think you're right. There's like, you know, everything is a balance of, you know, cost and value and understanding what the, the end goal is. But I think one of the things that gets overlooked so often is labor yeah. and SOPs and training. And oftentimes we think, oh, great. I built this facility. I have these great genetics. Well, who's actually going to grow the plants and how do you train them? You know, what is your IPM application strategy and who's going to do it? How are they going to do it? When are they going to do it? What's your cleaning procedure? With what? What's your trimming procedure? Mm -hmm. You know, all these things have... How many times does it get touched in a whole cycle? You know, all these things affect the end consumer experience. And uh, I think it's important to factor in labor and training. And um, I think we see a lot of opportunities in the space to continue to refine the training of this industry. But I've also seen a ton of growth. Um, and it's great to see people at a high level of academic research receiving PhDs and studying cannabis. And I think that's, you know, just one step in the right direction of a uh, great. Now we're getting the science. Let's get the labor. Let's get the application. Let's get the financial acumen up and combine all these aspects so we can truly make a decision on where to allocate these limited financial resources to get the best reward at the end or meet our goals at the end of this production facility. Great, great. Uh, to piggyback a little bit, um, what, what's the best way to measure leaf temperature? The infrared, clear camera, something else? Best way to measure leaf temperature. Well, here. You can definitely use infrared thermometry, like an IR gun. But one thing to keep in mind is that if you go and buy one of these from Home Depot to measure the temperature of your canopy, they're typically calibrated for drywall um, to measure the temp of the drywall for contractors. So there's an adjustment called emissivity. And you have to adjust the emissivity rating on these IR guns to be able to get an accurate temperature reading on a plant surface. I found from reading white papers and stuff that about 0.97 to 0.98 is the right emissivity setting for these IR guns to get an accurate temperature. However, this is not an automated process and you can't get real-time reading, you know, it's a spot check. FLIR cameras or thermal imaging cameras are a great um, target for automating that process and getting real-time VPD calculations. But I think that there needs to be some further R&D to refine that technology. The angle of the camera plays a big role in getting accurate readings, the distance from the canopy, um, the height of the lights, um, and plus it's a lot more expensive than one of these, right? And so you have to think about costs as well. Um, what does it cost someone to go in and pay a labor to go check your temp and record it versus a real-time reading, right? So... I think we get the cost of those flare cameras down and re refine the application of them on, on this, in these rooms, that would be a really good target. 
I think another thing to think about too, and we talk about this all the time, right, is canopy cubic footage and which leaf are we measuring? Yeah. How deep into the canopy do we go? How do we come up with an appropriate average? You know, it's, it becomes such a challenge mm -hmm. um, in really understanding real time leaf temperature data relative to airflow and homogenization of the space relative to leaf temp offset to light. Um, is, so for me, it's almost like it's a constant that needs to constantly be recalibrated. I mean, like you mentioned, the distance from the light, right? So that means even if we have one lighting source and we understand the offset at X amount of feet, as those plants grow, that offset becomes different. Mm -hmm. um, and what is the real focus? It's just another part of plant flow process and cultivation techniques and canopy management to try and get that canopy as even as possible and understanding the depth of the canopy and the penetration of the light. Um, there's a lot of factors. It's not as simple as just running or poke your head in the room and see the first leaf and shoot it and know the leaf temp offset. It's about trying to understand that room as a whole and the canopy as a whole. And I saw someone throwing a link to an, an IR camera. Definitely an option as well. I haven't investigated that as much, but any way that, you know, infrared thermometry is very similar, right? This is just a gun. We can also use cameras to do it. And that could be a, a great technology as well to investigate for real-time VPD readings. Okay. Um, quickly, maybe you guys can touch on... Um, explaining uh, how the different H HVC conditions affect the crop and how tight control is required in terms of temp and humidity? I think this is a pretty good one. I mean, there's a, several different angles here. And my mind first goes to the accuracy of the sensors and the data that you actually collect. Mm -hmm. So we have all these different parameters that we can control and they're scientifically backed on the actions we take and what the final product should see. Um, but it's so easy to just, and we, Anders and I talk about this all the time because we have such different experiences in the cultivation space. You know, the first thing I'm going to do when I go into a space is read the plants. The first thing he's going to do is read the data and then we're going to switch and we're going to make sure that there's a correlation there. And that's some of the challenges that we've seen in this industry is sensor drift and lack of recalibration lack of accuracy of certain sensors, sensors that are affected by IR in the room or heat in the room or light in the room. Right. Um, so it's really fun to think about how you can apply HVACD as a tool for crop steering. Um, but without accurate data, how do you create an accurate action plan? Yeah, no, I, I, I totally hear you on that. And also the parameters and the control, it, it's, um, it depends on what kind of lighting type you're using. You know, it depends on what stage of growth you're in as well. I mean, obviously, one of the biggest challenges of controlling an environment. Indoor growth, uh, I think so your mic just cut out, buddy. Looks like the video feed just froze as well. We lost yeah. Anders. Environment and indoor growth. Uh, if, you know. There it is. There I am. Okay, cool. Sorry about that, guys. Um, I was going to say one of the biggest challenges of controlling environment in an indoor grow is uh, the lights off to lights off transition, right? We have all that sensible, you know, heat and sensible load when the lights are on. And when it goes off, we get this huge spike in relative humidity. And it's not high relative humidity that's going to give us mold. It's going to be those big swings in relative humidity that's going to mold our crop. And so having equipment that can control that spike during that transition is a, a great tool for IPM. Uh, and just to make sure that this plant is seeing the right environment every minute of every day, right? That's the goal of an indoor grower is to basically provide it with the perfect environment every minute of its entire lifetime. Is that always attainable? Definitely not, right? There's challenges in an indoor grow. Um, but trying your best at doing that is really our goal, you know, and so and I think to unpack that, you know, from a digestible action plan creation, to me, it's about 24 hour VPD control. We so often talk about, Hey, what's the right VPD when lights are on to, you know, for biomass accumulation or secondary metabolite creation, mm -hmm. but that lights off period is so important. Like, as you mentioned, from an IPM perspective, but 
you know, the two main plant processes that we're talking about here, are transpiration and the lights are on and respiration and the lights are off. And how do those factors of root zone temperature affect the ability of that plant to take up oxygen in the root zone? Um, it's just, a, there's a lot going on, but thinking about it from a 24 hour period, rather than just what can I do when my lights are on, let's think about how that plant repairs itself when the lights are off which prepares us to jump back into a high PPFD environment as soon as the lights come on. Um, I mean, that's a great debate about sunrises and sunsets and light intensity. Um, but I think the more that you can allow that plant to see the appropriate conditions when the lights are off, the better she'll perform when the lights are on. I usually say a healthy day requires a healthy night. Mm -hmm. And if you really wanna perform uh, and get as much out of that lighting period as you can, you need to let her sleep a little bit. And what I mean by that is just effectively take, uh, take care of the respiration process as well. Exactly. Yep. And I mean, again, it's, we control ambient in these rooms, the temperature and relative humidities to really control leaf temperature. That's what we really care about, right? We want to make sure that leaf temperature is in the proper zone for photosynthetic rate, metabolic rate, um, you know, maximum CO2 assimilation, which is going to pack on yield and biomass all those things. Got it. Great answers, guys. Um, so we're, we're getting on the one hour mark here. Um, we do have some more questions coming in. Um, how do you guys feel about extending another 10, 15 minutes? Sounds great. Fine with me. With that. All right, for, for those of uh, us that are on schedules, um, no, no problem popping off. We really appreciate the time that you spent with us today. and. Um, we're not going to be able to answer all the questions that came in today, but look forward to uh, jumping on or, or following up with everybody to have uh, more personal uh, conversations. Um, and uh, let's just uh, give it another 10 to 15 minutes here and uh, we can wrap it then. Um, another one on COAs. Um, what do you guys see as the range of terpene percentage that is attainable? Nice. I don't know if we know the upper limit yet. What's I the highest result you've seen? I think it was like four something. I don't know. Have you seen anything higher? Like you have you seen any five percent? I've seen a significant amount of fours, especially recently. I've talked to breeders that have their hands in the dirt and uh, it reminds me of, you know, just good storytelling where people said that they've cracked eight or even cracked 10. <laughs> and those numbers to me seem absurd. Yeah, they seem absurd. I've never seen them on paper, but I do know that there are breeders that prize terps and they are driving every aspect of their breeding and selection, whether it's male selection for, you know, to be a carrier male or to be an influencer male um, in trying to get more out of that female from a terp perspective. Um, I think, you know, we're going to continue to see those numbers grow, but like you said, I'm not exactly sure what that upper echelon is. Um, on paper, yeah, I mean, probably close to five is the highest I've seen, 4.8 or something like that. Yeah, and I mean, again, it's, you can only achieve that kind of number if you have good environmental control throughout your flowering cycle, but then also drying and curing. I was just going to say that. Right, because it's, Preserving terpenes to me is the same kind of mindset I used when making concentrates or like a winemaker does, right? The grower grows the grapes or grows the cannabis. And as a, as a concentrate manufacturer, you don't make anything. You just try and preserve it and keep that quality there, that quality, that resin and showcase it in its best possible manner. Right. And it's the same thing with terps on flower. You can, grow this, your room can be just so loud. You, you know what I'm talking about. You open up that room to your flower, that door to your flower room and you just get hit in the face. Like, Ooh, that's a good room. You know, it's, it's gas cake, <laughs> gas cake. Number three, <laughs> it's loud, you know, but if something goes wrong, you're drying and curing, or even in your post-processing and storage, how you handle it in transport through distribution and then to the dispensary shelf, that 4% might've existed when it was sent to the lab but I would wager that it's not that level by the time it gets to the consumer, right? And so I take them with a grain of salt. 
Um, but you know, the value of terpenes is high. There's definitely a, a room for breeding for higher percentages. I mean, think about a few decades ago, can, cannabinoids were back in the seventies were only eight to 12%, right? Cultivars would be eight to 12% THC. Now we're seeing stuff 35, 40%. And yeah, we can argue about moisture content and how that affects that overall potency, but still it's crazy how far we've come in terms of the potency of this plant. It's kind of insane. And now that the last, you know, five, six so years or so, a huge focus has been put on terps and terpenes. It's a, I'm sure we will see those numbers grow over time as well. Who knows what one gram can actually hold in bud? Like it's insane to think about. It's funny too. I remember the first time I cracked 30%, I was so proud. Now I'm like <laughs> embarrassed of those test results considering where the community's at. It's like, I was like, yeah, man, I cracked 30. Now I'm just like, you know, you need to be shooting higher than that yeah. considering the genetics and the level of control we have. Yeah. The, show me a test result at 40% THC with like 12, 13, 14% moisture content. That's really impressive. That's what I just showed. That's I know. one of the reasons I shared it. And I think the gamesmanship of that water content is really important here reading those COAs and understanding what they really say, like you do need to know the moisture content because, you know, 4% moisture content and 44% to me is not nearly as exciting. Mm -hmm. I know what the bud is going to burn. Like I know that it's going to be dry and crumbly and the same goes for Terps, right? It's a relational percentage and proportion. So yeah. there's this gamesmanship of how low do we let that moisture content number get in order to get high COAs, but still keep it high enough that we get customer satisfaction, yep. uh, shelf life, um, yeah. and just a product that people really want and enjoy. You know, I, I saw another um, question here in the chat that I'd just like to speak to real quickly. Essentially, it says, what, what are the best yields that phenotypes can achieve? And um, Christian here is speaking in grams per meter squared. Unfortunately, I'm here in California, and I speak in grams per square foot of canopy. Um, so I don't, off the top of my head, know the correlation to meter squared. Adrian, but, Adrian kind of did the conversion here, and it looks like uh, it's between 74 and 84 grams per square foot. Oh, that's what he put 800 to 900. Yeah. That's the translation of the standard measurement. Yeah. I mean, if, so th this is the way I think about it, right? Like if I was doing a pro forma to do a financial plan for my cannabis business, I would probably benchmark it at 55 grams a square foot, which is attainable and not everyone can attain it, but it's a good target to benchmark your business off of. Now, if you're getting closer to 20 grams per square foot, to you know, 25 grams per square foot, you might need to up that a little bit to, to survive in this industry. But if you're up at the 80 to 100 grams per square foot, you're killing. As well, long, especially if you on. have the quality too, because it's one thing to have yield, but it's also about quality. And I'm talking sellable flower weight, not trim plus smalls, plus everything. I'm talking 80 to 100 grams of sellable flower weight that's pretty impressive. I don't think I've ever seen anything too much over hundred grams per square foot of like actual sellable flower. And even that probably had a little bit of some smalls and B grade flower included in it too, but that's how you calculate it. And that's the importance of like understanding what the baseline for measurement is, right? We talk about this a lot too, with people throwing around, oh, I got a hundred grams a square foot. And then you realize they were measuring fan leaves and stems <laughs> yeah, exactly. and all this other stuff that like, come on, man, that's not going to go to market. You can't count that in the calculations. So really understanding what, in, what went into that and do you derate your smaller buds, you know, things like that. They're, they're big factors in trying to get everyone on the same page for communicating what a good baseline would be totally. um, or what a high level, you know, wh who's going to win that game is the person that really understands what is actually going to market, how to measure it and putting together a historical crop steering techniques per cultivar that allow you to achieve it. Totally. I mean, this even kind of reminds me of the discussion we had the other day around, um, you know, accounting practices in cannabis too, and how there's just so many different ways to report this information in a financial statement as well. It's like the same thing when we're talking about how to report our yield in grams per square foot, you know, there's a, a lot of non, uh, 
you know, generally accepted accounting principles that are applied to cannabis financial statements as well, too. It's, it's kind of, we still have a lot of things to figure out. That's a good point. Absolutely. Well, should we, uh, I'm thinking maybe we cap off this uh, conversation with uh, a question regarding growing media. Je Jesse, let you scratch your microbe itch. <laughs> uh, <laughs> don't get him started. Oh, man. That's why we're doing it at the end here. Okay. Good, good call. <laughs> All right. So um, high level thoughts on hydroponic versus soil grow growth media methods. Um, in terms of the highest quality of product, are both methods capable of reaching same or similar high quality end results? Um, just wondering if using hydroponic growth methods limits certain phenotypic uh, or phenotype expression in some cultivars. Um, if you're asking the plants to perform in an environment that is unnatural, are you limiting the phenotypic expression of your plants by growing hydroponically? You know, that's a super loaded question that we can unpack <laughs> yeah. 15 different ways. And the way I think Andrews and I talk about it, because I think as most people that know me know, like I love soil. I love microbiology. I love thinking about inoculating fungal colonies and nutrient cycling and the accumulation of molecules in the plant as a byproduct, microbes as pest defense, microbes for systemic acquired response, all these angles that microbes bring to the party doesn't necessarily mean they can't be included in hydroponic production. I think the part of differentiating hydroponics and let's call it a soil-based approach is the level of control and understanding you get. It's very challenging to understand. Let's say you do a, you know, a soil test or something like that to understand what's in the media that doesn't necessarily give you all the tools you need to truly crop steer from a fertigation and control perspective. It's about response time when you're making that decision. So in a hydroponic or quote unquote sterile media, you have the opportunity to control those variables with much more precision. Mm -hmm. I think that that creates an opportunity for you to potentially make mistakes. Um, and considering we don't have, you know, we're still, there's still emerging data. It's hard for me to say I'm 100% in the camp of nutrient salts and rock wool. But at the same time, I respect the fact that there's controlled, measurable applications that we can predicate action plans off of. Mm -hmm. um, the management of soil and soil re recycling and recycling media can be incredibly challenging. Um, and when we have a hydroponic media, it's so much easier to say, all right, we're done with this run. Now we're starting from scratch again and you have a blank slate to write your poem uh, and get this plant to market. Um, but I don't think that that necessarily means you have to exclude microbes, which is a whole other conversation. I just think from a crop steering and application standpoint, um, soil is more of like a very wide or very long tarmac for you to be successful on without precision measurable control. Whereas a hydroponic approach is shorter tarmac but very measurable. So if something well, it's goes- also from... about buffering in terms of risk, right? I mean, your plant is going to be somewhat safer in soil to an extent if something was to go wrong in an indoor facility. It provides more of a buffer to the plant, um, but it, the, the downside is then the responsiveness in eliciting certain crop steering techniques, you know, vice versa. If you, if you forget to water rock wool for a day, that plant's not going to live very long, right? Or There's... your pH sensor's off. Yep. You're going to get slammed with acid or alkaline, and that can yep. have a dramatic effect just in four applications. Totally. You know? I mean, I, I myself am more of a salt rock wool type grower, you know, into like precision agriculture, but I definitely respect the soil guys out there. It's a challenge. It's tough. To me, it's hard to duplicate and make consistent run to run, even though it, it is possible. Um, there's a lot of benefits of soil. Uh, and I've seen some wonderfully grown living soil cannabis. Some of the best flour I've ever consumed has come from living soil grown, you know, you know, media. But from a reproducibility, efficiency, cleanliness standpoint, it's hard to beat, you know, hydroponics with more of a sterile media. Um, you know, it, it's a give and take. It's really a preference thing. And it's about, you know. And it's a science thing. 
And we need more yeah. scientific research to truly understand what's going on in these organic soil-based medias to apply it. And, you know, my hope is that we get more soil guys embracing some of the fertigation crop steering techniques and we get more of these sterile salt based guys embracing the organic techniques, bringing amino acids and hormones and these other factors into the party rather than just thinking, Hey, what are the, you know, 19 nutrients that I need to deliver to this plant and instead think, how are these nutrients being available? How are they chelated at what levels? And what are the relationships between them? And we have some of that data. Um, but I think, you know, it, it's definitely a marriage of knowledge. It's not two camps that need to fight each other. It's two camps that need to respect each other. Um, and I get the people that are in the organic camp that say, hey, I don't ever want to use salts because they're synthetic. And if I, if I, you know, some of these chemicals end up in the soil and leach in, into our world and they're not healthy for us. But I think that's why it's so important to fine tune the control. Yep. And how much fertigation, how much runoff, and really being able to minimize the negative environmental effects of using synthetics. Um, but again, embracing some of these organic understandings, I think that's the marriage where you don't lose anything at all. It's nothing yep. but gain. You get the precision control, you get great phenotypic expression, you're maximizing and optimizing that plant. Yep. I mean, there has to be some middle ground, a hybrid approach to fully sterile and utilizing organics. You know, whether that is using some beneficial insects in your flowering room or using mycorrhizae fungi during the transplant, even if in rock wool, like there's still benefits you can get from organics um, in a sterile hydroponic media. But there's, you know, there, there could be a really good middle ground between the two that we just haven't dialed in yet as cultivators. Man, this could be our next webinar. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I like it. Well, hey guys, it's uh, we're 15 minutes past the hour. Um, I think uh, why don't we why don't we put a pin in it for now? And um, to our audience, thanks everybody for sticking around and uh, be on the lookout for our next webinar, which will be coming up uh, in July, end of July. Um, and uh, again, appreciate everybody's attendance and look forward to uh, continuing the conversation soon. Thanks everybody. Really appreciate the opportunity to to talk about these things that we love so much. So thanks for coming and uh, we look forward to doing another one for everybody. Yes, sir. Appreciate y'all for showing up. Thank you. Until next time.